today. Hello, and welcome everyone to another InventRight live stream. My name is Andrew Krause. I'm one of the co-founders here at InventRight, and Stephen Key here is the other co-founder. Together, we founded InventRight to coach and mentor inventors to license their products to big companies, and we've been doing that for 20 three years of ed students in over 65 countries. So um, I don't know, Stephen, I don't think we're experts at everything, but you do something for 23 years, uh, you, you better be good at it or you better oh, come do on, something Ed, else. We're great, we're great at everything, you know that. No, we're not great at everything, but we're great at licensing, I'll say that. I'll, I'll pat ourselves on the back for that one. But you, know, you got this vacation shirt on today, which really makes me jealous because I know you're in a warm climate down in down in las vegas and i'm up here kind of up in the snow still so i'm a little jealous here i don't like that shirt that's a terrible oh, yeah shirt. I'm, I'm i'm like i'm like shorts and like i got i'm not wearing socks <laughs> it got warm <laughs> it's nice <laughs> you got shorts on I, I got shorts on yeah i'm in so when, when i i live in henderson nevada just next to vegas and once it hits a certain time of the year you're not i'm not wearing socks i'm not wearing I'm wearing pants. I was going to say not wearing pants. <laughs> I'm wearing pants, but I'm wearing shorts. And then, but I'll wear like a dress shirt and then I'll be wearing shorts and no socks. You know? And I've got to ask you about something. You always, when I say Las Vegas, you always switch it over to Henderson. I do because. Why is that? I, because everybody knows Las Vegas, baby. They don't know that, Henderson. I, I really identify with Henderson. I, there's a lot of nice places in Las Vegas, but there's some sketchy places in las vegas too i don't know and man. and i think you do i don't Every, las vegas everybody knows las vegas around the world i they know, know but henderson i don't i don't identify with the strip i mean it's just a lot of weirdness there that's like a weird disneyland there's no walls but you drive into it and henderson uh, people don't understand living here like i never thought i'd live here i came to las vegas and so went to bad. like <laughs> stayed for like six days and i'm like i'm getting the hell out of here this place is just trying to yeah, bleed yeah. me of all my money yeah. but then you come and you live here and there's a community of people it's a great place to live we've had many students you're, that are you're, here. They, you're like the opposite of las vegas but see but that's what you think las vegas you were, is it's not you were what the, you think you were the opposite of las vegas there's, yeah well you, you, i'm the opposite of the strip but the strip you're, you're is not las the vegas opposite of it Okay, okay, think, if you want I to say that. Think, and I do think the strip is becoming remarkable. I do. Because yeah. it's changed. It's it's like the shops are great, the hotels are great, the events are great, the sporting events are wonderful. I mean, it is becoming the mecca. So I don't know. You know, I think A lot of great think, things I, about I the you, strip. I think you need but, to go down to the strip once and take a look around. Because I, well, I, I think I have. I, I, I'm well, like, no, I, I never need to see another... Ahead. I never I, need to see another Cirque du Soleil show in my life. I don't you, want you know, to. I've seen I them all. I think you kind of avoid it. That's what I think. Because I think you do because when you live here, I mean, I don't know. You live next to Disneyland. You go there every day. I no. don't know. Maybe once in a while you go there. But I will say, I mean, <laughs> if you want to pay the money, which I don't, except on like my anniversary with my wife or something, like, you can get the best food in the world. Better than Paris. Better than anywhere in the world in las that. vegas oh, um uh, but if so if you're okay. a real you know culinary person that's all right. right you make me jealous okay okay so i think we ramble long enough because people are starting to show up so we can can well we can and hit. i want to talk about what happened last night because <sighs> iga talk about iga first of all what is i what is iga well, I mean, it started with one thing, then it kind of became something else. So Stephen and I, a lot more Stephen than myself, but we've been speaking to inventor groups for decades, decades. And we got to know them and we realized these, the leaders of these groups are like, they're like saints, you know? Uh, I mean, you know, maybe they're taking 10 bucks at the door or something, but they're trying to bring speakers in like Stephen and myself to educate folks, but nobody's really supporting them. So we sponsored this thing where we went out to, um, uh, 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 Washington, D.C., to not lobby, you're not supposed to say that, talk to our congressmen and folks about better laws for inventors. And so we got to hang out with all these inventor group leaders for, for days. And we said, you know, let's start something that helps these inventor group leaders support their folks. So then we started IGA. And then it kind of morphed into like, why not? For? IGA stands for what? What's inventor, inventor Groups of America. Yeah. And so we said, well, why don't we start doing online education? So we'd started doing weekly, sorry, monthly 
seminars for people with all from all different points of view invent rights all about licensing but you have people come on about venturing all different points of view and uh it's some amazing speakers we had kathy vidal the director of the entire patent office a lot of successful inventors patent attorneys prototypers a lot of different folks so it's all free you know and so you and i started that organization now go like oh, let's start another business we're like let's just start an organization everything's free you and i put our money into it we don't make any money with that organization. We don't care. We're just trying to help. Um, and last night we had an InventRight coach on, Courtney. Yeah. And this woman is amazing. Um, she's is she still in her 20s. I think she is. I don't think she's 20 even 30. going on who knows what. 20, yeah, she's very mature for her age. Yeah. And she just did. I'll let you talk about. I you think wanna... that the topic, everybody, the topic which was truly amazing was AI how to mm -hmm. use artificial intelligence to be a creative tool for all of us. And if you're not aware of those tools, man, you're living in a cave. So she went ahead and spent, she told us, she spent about 50 hours doing all the research for us to understand all the different, uh, different types of programs you can use and how to use them. So if you missed it, we had a big crowd too, right under a couple hundred people too. It was a big crowd. No, it was like it was like I think it was 180 at the peak or something. It like was that. a good crowd. Yeah, yeah. If you have missed it, it's you can watch it over at InventRight TV. We just posted it up there. Oh, did it go up already? Oh, I great. think it's already up there. It's going to be up there in a minute anyway. But go up there okay. and check it out, you guys. And I'll tell you, if you're not aware of what's going on, uh, dive in a little bit. It's a little overwhelming, though, Andrew. When I looked at it, I was oh, like, yeah. what the heck? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you and I, I think I'm not going to tell you what you have done or not, but I've just used chat GBT to, to do oh. some basic, ask it some questions. It's yeah. amazing. But she showed us how to create artwork with artificial intelligence and how to do a whole bunch of other things. And um, I think she said there was at least a thousand AI programs, some 2,500, 2500. some open source, 2,500 and some paid and uh, she just goes with does the free ones 2500 the big takeaway that i had at the end and i asked her that question I, she said she started using it and she wasn't what did she call it she called it it's not word engineering what was it called oh, 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 oh. the prompt engine prompt. prompt engineering yes guys it's a trip like you got to use the right word she said she wasn't using the right word she watched a bunch of youtube videos about it and she got better results when she used different words so some of you guys are like well i'm not an engineer well this isn't about being an engineer this is about using the right words to prompt the artificial intelligence to do what you want it to do and um and i made the comment i wasn't being critical but i find a lot of inventors don't know even how to do basic work searching for similar products on Google. Because yeah. I talk to inventors all the time. They tell me they what the product they is. They and I do a 30 second search. I'm like, what's this? And they're like, oh, how did you find that? I'm like, they, well, I just searched this. And so I just to encourage people, but also let people know if you're having a hard time with AI, you're probably not using the right words. You need to watch some trainings. You need to watch you need to watch Courtney's. Watch Courtney's training. Yeah. And then you need to watch more to to use the right words is I don't think it's something you're going to do perfectly right off the bat. Andrew, what I want to do before we get into the questions because they're coming in, I want to talk a little bit about, and I want to give some people some things to think about how to increase your chances yeah. of product licensing success. Right, and I've got a whole list of things I want to talk about. So first of all, Andrew, no, what we don't is want we don't want that, Stephen. We want to struggle. We no, want to do everything no. wrong. <laughs> okay, so Andrew, before we start, what is product licensing? Really short, really quick. What is it? Product licensing is renting your product to a large company, could be a medium sized or small company, and they are going to manufacture it. They're going to use their employees. You don't need to hire employees. They're going to use their money. You don't need to raise money. And they're going to tap into their distribution. If they, if it's a pet product and they're in 30,000 stores, boom, you're hopefully you're in 30,000 stores. So you don't need to start a business. Their money, their employees, their existing distribution, they're going to do all the work. But you have to do the work to close the deal. Okay. 
There you go. All right, you guys, I'm going to go through part of it. Then we're going to answer questions and I'll come back just like we've done before. So the first thing here, you guys, if you want to increase your chances of product licensing success, here it is. Number one, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. Now, what do you mean you don't have to reinvent the wheel? I like to look at product licensing as making small improvements on existing ideas. It's really more about innovation, right? You're not trying to create something so new that's going to take so much time and education and it just it's just going to drive you crazy. You want to make small improvements on existing ideas. Now, why is that those small improvements on existing ideas is moving that innovation a little bit forward, which all you really need to do, you know there's a market out there because they're already selling existing ideas. You're just making it better. Yeah, and most likely it can be manufactured, and that is less risk for companies to work with you. So that's the first. Now, one. now why? Now why is it less risk for a company when you're making small improvements as well, opposed they're, to? They're already selling something there, there now, like it. Right, or somebody, or their competitor is. Maybe they're selling stuff in that space. They already know it. People are buying it. People need it. Yeah. And market demand is probably. The most important thing when you're coming up with ideas, knowing that people actually will buy it. And people don't realize that. They'd rather spend money on patents or prototypes. And they don't even know if anybody even wants it. So InventRight's you, all about fixing you, that too. Have you noticed that people think, some inventors think, some people with ideas think, it needs to be like some, something mind-blowing? And what do you have to say about that? Does does a new product need to be this mind blowing invention no, that's it, so like, oh it, my God, I've never seen anything no, like it, this? It, it can be. It can be, yeah. But does it doesn't it need have to, be? to be. It doesn't have to be. We're talking yeah. about small improvements, moving innovation at little steps, mm -hmm. showing something new. All right, number two, you guys, real quick. Number two, stay in one or two industries. Don't mm. jump around. This mm. is what you do. Typically, and I've done this too, you come up with a lot of ideas and you, you try one over here and you cement one over here and you're jumping over to another industry over here. And before you know it, you don't get to know the companies. You don't get to know the people. You're not building relationships because you're just being so creative, which is great, but you're not spending enough time on the industry to really know the people and building building relationships and so those potential licensees actually become clients and does it get easier when you stay in an industry yeah andrew because you don't have to reach out and knock on the door all the time because the door is already open mm -hmm. so stop jumping around that's number but, two. you know it, but you know making relationships with people at these big companies sounds scary but i just break it down and say the way you make the relationship is to send them the first product and to get a no. Now, you only need one yes, and you know you might get 29 no's out of the 30 companies you approach, you get that one yes, and you license to them. But though all those no's, and including the one yes, you made a relationship. You didn't waste their time. You sent a, a nice email that was short, succinct, to the point. You sent a nice sell sheet, they got it. Maybe they weren't interested in that one. Don't get your feelings hurt. Feel good that they took the time to get back to you to say no, no thank you on this product. They didn't say no, thank you, and never reach out to me again. <laughs> they don't. They're not going to say that. If well, they, it, they might if you act like a wacky inventor, but uh, rarely. If you are well, professional, you, that's how you make the relationship. Yeah, and once you start building that relationship, they will start to give you feedback, and and that's where they'll start to talk to you, and they'll tell you what they're looking for. Okay, I'm going to give one more, and then we're going to answer questions here. Okay. We're, we're all we're talking about today how to increase your success at product licensing. That's what we're talking about. And number three on the list is you have to be disciplined in exercising your creative muscle, right? Because hmm. if you're waiting for inspiration to strike, or if you're right. waiting for you to see a problem that you're going to solve, you're not doing this right. You've mm -hmm. got to realize that you are creative. You just, some of us don't know how to practice it, how to exercise that muscle and how to call upon our creativity at any time we want. We're in control of it. I can create products in the morning, afternoon, Saturday, Sundays. I'm in control of my creativity. 
And if you don't have the tools to figure out how to do that yet, you're going to have to learn how to do that. Yeah. So And, and uh, now focusing what you said earlier, you said when you stay in an industry or two, you, you make relationships by reaching out the first time. Focusing your creativity on products in the space in which you already have relationships because you reached out for one product. A lot of people listening, they haven't started reaching out yet, Stephen. So they don't, they're not even there yet, but that's where they need to be thinking about going, you know, and it's pretty easy. I mean, you can get on Google images and let's say you're working on dog toys. You look at all the dog toys. You look at where the, the holes are. It's not rocket science, is it? No. Okay. That's number three. So Andrew, let's ask some questions because okay. I have a lot more later. Okay. All right. Let's see what we got here from Randy. I haven't even read it yet. Uh, Randy said, I have an idea for a redesign of a garment product. Okay. Yeah. The redesign has extra features that what is on the market. Now, what would be the next steps to be after a patent search? Okay. So Stephen, as you and I know, the fashion industry, all they do is knock each other off. This is a unique industry. Um, how they protect themselves is with uh, trademarks. So Donna Karen or, or Polo or Ralph Lauren or whatever. And so when one of those major designers comes out with a new fashion design, everybody else is knocking them off because it's next to impossible to protect a, a garment of clothing. Now, there are exceptions like the woman that did Spanx and there's functional clothing and things like that. Um, but if you're trying to approach Randy, traditional clothing companies with your invention, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, now, there are the functional clothing you get a patent on. So you really can't get a patent. I'm not, it's not legal advice. Please consult your attorney if you're looking for legal advice. I don't know what your product is. But generally, you can't get a patent on a piece of clothing unless it has functionality. So, but even when it has functionality, is that going to be harder than a dog toy or a medical device or something? Yeah, it is. Okay. Andrew's absolutely 100% right here. I rambled on that, didn't I? But <laughs> I it, tried is to get changing. It, it is changing a little bit. It is changing, and because I was at a conference where one person I was talking to, all he does is work on this industry of how to protect stuff in the fashion industry. And you're going to start to see more things being protected now sure. because Andrew's right. People have just been stealing or borrowing or knocking off. So they're, they're trying to fix this a little bit. So you're going to start seeing some changes here, Randy. They're not here yet. They are happening. But Andrew's right. I would do this. I would make sure there's some functionality to it. You have to be in order to get a patent. Okay, number two. I would reach out to one of those companies and ask them, how do you work with vendors or do you? And, and find out how that's going to be structured first. I would do that before I even file a patent. Oh, yeah. I would do that before I even file the PPA. Now, the reason why... If I reach out to 10 companies I think are a good fit and all of them say, forget it, Randy, we're not interested, then I might not go forward with it. They might not. Okay. Most of them won't even look at an idea. That's, you know, most that's what clothing I manufacturers won't. I, so filing a patent or doing a patent search is not the first thing for me. Right. Right. All right. There you go. Let's go to the right. next one. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good uh, one, let's see. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Stefan, he's a good, that's a good name, isn't it? Yeah. Steven, Stefan, uh, do you, do you offer brokerage services? Steven, do you want me to answer that? Or do you, well, ahead, basically, <laughs> mean, well, no, you know, I'm going to ramble for like 30 minutes on that. If I answer this one, God, I hope not. Uh, I'll try <laughs> to keep it really short. Uh, so, you know, Sylvia and Dana in our company, they, they talk to people interested in our program. They're salespeople. Great, great people. Stephen and I do too. We talk to somebody every other day at the very least, sometimes every day, that's been taken for ten or twelve thousand dollars by an invent. They, they they don't mind necessarily call themselves this, but they're an invention promotion company. The Federal Trade Commission, the Patent Office would define them as invention promotion companies. Basically, with a lot of these companies, not talking about any company in particular, you could have a lump of coal. They're going to tell you it's great. Oh, I love your lump of coal. That's great. You're going to make millions, you know, or whatever. Okay. Um, and then they pretend to work on it. And a lot of times in the contract says they need to submit your idea to industry, which means they could like spam three people and they met their contractual obligation to you. But what we see on the end is they had it for 10 months, a year or so, maybe a little more, and I've seen nothing from it. 
half the time they won't tell you what companies they're reaching out to even if they did and you called how could you prove that they reached out to and the operator would be like i get hundreds of calls a day i have no idea if that company called right um in the 20 i'm just talking about my personal experience in the 23 years i've been doing event right i've never met a single inventor that had an invention promotion company license a product for them but every day every other day i get these people saying hey they're like licking their wounds this happened to me a year ago this happened to me 10 years ago and they're still like upset about it but you guys are the real deal and i'm ready to do the work i can tell you're not what they are you're going to make me do the work i'm like damn straight we are and if you don't want to we don't want you <laughs> you know so that's a uh, long story short i can just talk from my personal experience yeah. did i answer that steven okay so there you go steven um there there you go that's all i can say there all right uh what else we got here uh da -da -da. okay well this is wow we're getting a lot of questions about the help we offer uh have 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 all uh the one-on-one -on -one coaching is for six months as i understand but if student doesn't and hasn't done a licensing deal is there still support from event right afterwards and what type of support so you know our program's always been six months for the one-on-one -on -one coaching but we didn't raise the price and we added another six months of our alumni plus membership which includes group coaching and includes our smart pitch sessions for reaching out to companies includes co-founder calls with steven and myself all the trainings our bridging the gap program where we bring a whole bunch of extra stuff so you know we wanted to as to kind of taper people off a little bit if they're like i got my one-on-one -on -one coaching but i'm still reaching out i still need to get some questions answered now some people will continue on with it is everybody going to license a product during that six months of course not you know steven is like he's joking <laughs> yeah of course not but you know we do two things here at invent right oh. we help people put their best foot forward so they're the highest chance possible of licensing the product but we also give people real life experience i call it experiential learning so they have experienced the entire process and we want them to say to us at some point i get it guys i don't need you anymore if i get myself in a difficult deal i know you got my back i can come back but i can approach companies myself now i can do all of this and so we empower we do experiential learning with real life projects it's not like you go to school and you study and study and take a test and it's all like book learning no it's real stuff you're doing it so Man, you, you got to answer a question, Stephen. I'm just going off on a tangent. Well, I'm just listening. You know, I'm going to sit here and take a little nap and just listen to you go on and on and on. All right. Well, well, well wait, hey, wait, well, wait. James let says me... your mic is low, but I don't think it's low at all. I can hear you just fine. So there you go. Well, oh. let me get a little. How about now? No, it's fine. It's fine. He's changed my mic a little bit. You guys, let's do this. I want to jump in and talk about number four of how to increase your chances of success. Here he goes. Number okay. four you absolutely need feedback i'm here to tell you you have to have it from who from from someone that knows what the heck they're talking about now yeah. i what i've realized in my career but also talking to large companies they've all told me the same thing they said steve most ideas that come to us we have to work with the inventor on things to change it for things that maybe need to be changed. It could be costing, it could be whatever. And then what it looks like when it eventually hits the store shelf is completely kind of different. Yeah. Well, don't say completely. You're going to freak people well, out. It, they kind of take it, it personally. It could be better. Yeah, but, it, it but, is quite often. All right. But you're working with the company and they're giving you that feedback mm -hmm. and the thing starts to evolve. Okay. They also are telling me that um, that's how that process kind of works. And we don't really understand it. So if you're if you're submitting to companies and they're not giving you feedback, you don't know what to do. You're kind of in a dark here. You do know two things. Well, number one, they're not giving me feedback. And sometimes you can't ask for it. And the reason why you can, but they're not going to give it to you. That's because they don't know you yet. You haven't invested enough time in them. Hmm. for them to invest in time with you right how do you, so you, how, ask, do you in, how do you invest time with them how what do you mean well by that? you have to submit one mm -hmm. make sure it's done good it has right. to look like a you have to be in the club if, if you show something that andrew and i see all the time some sell sheets 
that aren't done professionally, you're not in the club. They're going to look at that and they're going to put you on the side and they won't deal with you. They don't have time to educate you, right? Right. Because they're looking at a lot of ideas. So what happens is, but let's say you do and your sell sheet looks good. They see it. They go, hey, this guy's, this guy looks pretty good. Looks like he's doing, he's acting professional. He's doing all the right things, but it's just not right for us. So we reject it. And you come back and you say, hey, thanks a lot, you guys. I'll come back with another idea. So a couple months later, or maybe a month later, maybe three weeks later, you come up with another idea. Your sell sheet looks great. You send it to them. They say, hey, hey, Steve, not quite yet, but man, this is looking pretty good. So you come back again on third time, Mm -hmm. right? And they see you not going away. They see you caring about them. They see you invest your time with them. Now they're willing to give you the feedback, right? Okay. So that's how you generally, now you can ask for feedback at the very beginning, but trust me, they're not going to give you much because they're busy. That's not their job to yeah. make your product better. You know, okay. I, I, I talked to a company at the hardware show and this gentleman said, um, I never, I just say no. I never give an explanation because he said, I've had too many inventors Ugh. be whiny and complain and but, 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 and tell me I'm stupid and stuff. And he's like, I don't have time for that. When I respond, I just say yes or no. I just say, maybe I'm interested. I'd like to talk or I say no. I, and it doesn't matter what they do. I will not give feedback. Now, that was this one guy. They don't all feel Andrew, like Andrew, it's, it's common. And here's the other thing, too. Um, I saw a sell sheet that was just done recently. And the sell sheet was great. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's good sell sheet. Um, and I think the inventor was really happy with it. So they, she, he shared it with me. I took a look at it and I looked at it. And I go, yeah, the sell sheet's great. I don't know what the product is. Well, then it's not great. You mean it well, looked the layout's great. great. It looked pretty. Right. The okay, layout's right. great. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you told me about this one. Yeah. All right. So what I wanted to say to that person, look, you need guidance. It's not just a sell sheet. You need guidance on your marketing. Are you communicating clearly? You need feedback. Right. And if you're not getting it from somebody that's that kind of understands it could be it, you could show you could actually show your sell sheet to somebody else you don't even know and say, hey, do you understand what the heck this is? That's right. still feedback. But yeah. I'll tell you, if you're not getting feedback from a company or for someone that really knows what you're doing or even a coach, that coach, the coaches we have are giving our students feedback constantly. And, and, and without it, you're in the dark. So anyway, I'm going to move on. So this particular want- this particular sell sheet, it, it looked pretty. Because a graphic designer did it, what he told him, but the marketing sucked, and you're like, I don't know what this product Andrew, is. Andrew, it's just that's, I don't know what to tell them. I, I don't want to tell them. Okay, right. I'm going to go. That was number four. I'm going to number five right now. Then we we'll get to another question. Number five. Okay. Mm-hmm. You need to get their wish list. You guys, I think you're doing it all wrong. I'm here to tell Andrew. You've heard me say this many times. If you really want to increase your chances of success, you need a wish list. You need a target to hit. But Stephen, how do you, they're not going to give that to you. How are you going to get well, a wish list? Okay. You can get the target to hit a couple different ways. If I cannot get the wish list because I haven't submitted three ideas to them yet and I haven't got rejected three times, so they're not going to give me my wish, my hit list. How can I get the hit list? Well, you have to go to their website, really understand their products, look at their material, look at the price point, look at the reviews, look at the mission statement. Really understand it and not just look for that submit button at the very top that we always do. That way you can kind of see what they're looking for. What are they doing? You can kind of you can kind of figure out what what where it's going next. That's their hit. That's the hit list. That's the target. Good. So that to me is number five, you guys. We'll go to number six in such a minute, uh, in just a minute. But these are ways to increase your chances of success. So go ahead, Andrew. What's the next question? All right, so let's do this one. This is an interesting one. I don't know if it's going to show the whole thing. Okay. Um, David said, I shall send by a new on-demand electric power plant video from our proof of concept site in North Wales for your opinions and greatly needed advice. Okay. So, Stephen, I get I get these. I get folks. I get inventors. I call them energy inventors, right? And I'm just going to be really honest. They fall into different categories. I'll start with the worst. I get people that are mentally ill, 
you know, it's like the guy that that has a sign that says it's the end of the world and he's walking around the streets in New York City or something. Okay. Yeah, I can run a car off a gallon of gas and for years and well, I'm like, okay, what's your background? He has no engineering background, anything. I'm like, okay. All right. Now, when you're a legitimate energy inventor uh, and you're saying incredible stuff that people don't believe, some of them are going to think you're that guy. So the reason why I mentioned that guy is you got to say and do things so they don't think you're that guy when you make these fantastical statements. And I see legitimate energy inventors that have an engineering background or smart, and they, they actually, they maybe don't have a working prototype. That's a big problem. Sometimes it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to prove something out, which may be something David has here. And they're like, well, I, I, I need a hundred, couple hundred thousand to prove it out. Or somebody says, look, I fixed it on a small scale. I did it on a small scale. I'm like, ooh, that's great. So you got to say that if you can prove it. Because even when you say you believe you can do it, and but you need hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's kind of hard to license, right? That's hard. So, um, so I call these folks energy inventors, and David's an energy inventor. I don't know what his background is. And you, it, you know, but I look at this tough. as not a simple idea. I look at this at the very beginning of the first slide I showed you, don't reinvent the wheel. Right. Yeah, what he's doing is could be brilliant. And, and I'm sure it is, David. But the problem is to cross that bridge to commercialization is going to take time, money, persistence, and a lot of luck. And today we're talking about how to increase your chances of success. But if you have these type of projects that Andrew's just mentioned, they're going to be difficult. There mm -hmm. you go. Yeah. One, one piece of advice I give people, because most of you probably are an energy inventors, I put it, um, figure out if you can do it on a small scale. Could you do that in a generator for the house, a lawnmower or something, prove the technology out and then do it with a new dam or power plant or something? And you just, yeah. you know, you just killed this guy's dream here. You know what I'm saying? No, you're I didn't. I'm showing him how to dream I'm, killer today. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm actually not. <laughs> um, so, but he, he says right. he has a proof of concept in North okay. Wales, All proof right. of All concept. Right. Um, okay. And so, uh, David, it's going to be very, very difficult. Can you do it? You can. Uh, you can, but it's just if you uh, have another thing that's I a little he's easier. Young. You might I hope he's really young. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. Um, okay, so next one is they're mentioning Dario Antonioni is one of our students that did this Grid It product. And it's a really cool product. He had like hundreds of versions of this for backpacks, for binders, for anything. And it lets you create a pocket anywhere. So, and you're like, oh, it's just a bunch of elastic straps. No, it was very cleverly done. Did you just pull that out of your back pocket there? Yeah, yeah. it was right It was right here. I was going to say, how did you just have that? Is that a fake question for you just to pull it off? No, no, William. No, I don't know William here. But he said, I have a redesign for the Gridit product by Good. Dario. Who is the best person to, to, to uh, contact? So, with this product, Dario license, this is very unusual. I've only seen it a couple times, Stephen. Guys, so guys, don't think this is normal. He was making so much money on that. As I recall, Stephen, they bought him out. Yes, they, they did. wanted to buy him out. Yes, so they did. So he doesn't own the intellectual property on that. They bought him out. I'd approach the company that, that is currently making it, if they still are. I haven't checked. Or, yeah, or anybody else in that or, category of organ, yeah, organization. If, if you've got, if you can get around whatever intellectual property there is, the company yeah, that he yes. licensed to, you could do license a variation of it. Um, so it's not the best person. Uh, William, when you reach out uh, to the potential license, all I see on social media is him on vacation now. I've seen that for years. Now. <laughs> He's made some money. God, do you, uh, do you, Stephen? Do you remember Jack Lowe? He was uh, he he wrote for Nolo Press. He spoke yeah. at the Inventors Group, my Inventors Group. You always yeah, spoke yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a patent agent. Yeah. And and as somebody told me, they saw him a couple years back driving around a Lamborghini. So he he created a, a computer mouse that works in the handshake position rather than like this, it's like this. And he made like insane money. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's interesting how sometimes that goes. We, we guys, we don't really pre pre preach that. Most of the time you're not gonna become a multimillionaire off of Andrew, one don't product. Don't do that. Go ahead, but what else we got? Anyway, anyway so uh, that way there's some advice to William on where to go, but you should be reaching out to if okay. you can, 20, 30 companies, not one company. Uh, okay. Oh, this is, I'm going to let you answer this one, Steven. This is for you. You, gotta, you, gotta, you get the trash. 
your wife, why do you give me that question? <laughs> I've got an idea for a tr for the trash industry. Where do I start? Well, Andrew, where do you start? You start by educating yourself, right? You start by reading all about the options, venturing or licensing. You start by reading good books, articles, taking a deep breath. You don't start out by rushing out, filing a patent, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're all about taking your time to educate yourself. So I'm saying this, just, just slow it down, watch the videos at InventRight TV, go to our free resources at inventright.com, start to educate yourself. I do know this, if you have an idea that has to do with the government, that gets a little tricky, right? Mm. And even it could be the government, it could be, maybe it's federal, maybe it's regional, it just gets complicated. So understand that if you, you know, where you play and see if there's other products in that category mm -hmm. and, and see who's doing what. So, and maybe it's the trash industry. I'm not quite sure exactly what that means, but I'm going to guess you're dealing with um, probably some big operations, could be recyclable, could be who knows what it is. Do your homework, who's doing what, where are they doing it, and understand the landscape first. That's what I would do. You're, you're very right, Stephen. I mean, is it commercial or is it consumer? Is it is it the dumpsters that they pick up, you know, or yeah. is it or is it recycling a processing plant? You know, so let's say it's the dumpsters that they that they pick up, the commercial dumpsters, or one for the home. Well, you look at the companies selling dumpsters. Those would be the companies you license to, or selling garbage cans. That might you know? I don't know at your house. I, Stephen, I don't know but... if I'd call it the trash industry. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I mean, or if it's a I garbage mean, can for your house, well, well and, and, then it's the company selling garbage well, cans well, at retailers. Uh, you know, it's you like. You know what's really great about the, that, Andrew? This product. That was fun. Um, this is a hundred percent curbside recyclable package that eliminates the plastic rings. So I guess I could say I'm in the trash industry, but I would never say that. Okay, so. <laughs> That's funny. Although there is that, what it, it's a, uh, there's a, tr I love tell that. people I, what trinkets and trash is. That's a different I, thing. I love when, now when people ask me that, I'm going to say I'm in the trash industry. I love that. I think it's funny. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's take a break. I'm going to go to number six. All right. Number six, how to create or how to increase your chances of licensing success. This is actually going to be a little bit different. This is going to say, how do I keep getting paid? Right? Here's an easy thing to do. Create line extensions. Extend the life of your product. Don't stop inventing. Once you come up with the idea, you license it, think about what other line extensions could there be? Different sizes, maybe a different way to use it. Whatever, make improvements. Mm -hmm. You want that product to last forever. Because <laughs> once you get it in, and the person that's really good at this is one of our students, Scott Bauman. I think Scott is the, like the, the greatest at this, right? There, mm -hmm. God, Andrew, mm -hmm. these questions are great. Uh, <laughs> this is just one of his products, he has many. Yeah. He's got so many line extensions. I think he's licensed over 40 ideas. The guy's brilliant. You know who else is great at this too, about line extensions? Uh, we have another student, Keith, down in, I think, somewhere down in San Diego. You know what he does, Andrew? He comes up with one idea, but he doesn't sell just one product. He sells a whole product line, mm -hmm. right? So, so when you see his products on the market, sh on the shelf, he's got like an end cap. When he's because we had that student that lived up in the Yukon in Canada and he licensed to a company a whole line of he showed him one camping product. They're like, What else you got? He's like, Well, I got this. What else you got? Let's show us everything. And he licensed like eight or nine products all at once. That's not very common. And then other people, what they'll do is they'll license something and it'll start to sell. And they're like, Well, this is selling well. Oh, here's another one. Here's another one. And, and you have that intention. What is your advice there? You typically don't want to show a company 10 products. Well, once, Andrew, right? I think this comes down that the people that we just mentioned, just so we're clear on this, everybody, when you're first starting out, you're doing some basic things, maybe a sell sheet, maybe a PPA, right? And those are just basic things, guys. And and Andrew and I hear this all the time. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't need any help. I got a sell sheet. I, I've got a uh, list of companies. No, 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 no. This is what they say. I'm far along. And I we're know. like, what does that mean? I, no, that, that doesn't mean, that means, no, you're not. When they hear that, that, that tells me you're not far along at all. 
because what you just said to me that I did some a couple things, tasks. I did some tasks. And so we talked about this before. Those tasks at the very beginning is filing a PPA, making a sell sheet, making a list of companies. You're right here at the very you're at the very beginning of your journey. The guys that we just talked to, like Keith and, and Scott, those guys, the Damien up in up in uh, Canada, those guys are at the next level. Okay. They're they're the next level. Like yeah. because they're thinking differently now. They've been educated enough to realize, hey, it's great to get one idea in, but how do I increase my chances of success? Line extensions. And they do all this clever stuff. And there's another, there's another stage beyond that now. So, and I think as you keep at this, you realize there's just levels, Andrew. There's levels. Mm -hmm. So so those guys are at a different level. That's what I'm saying. That they are smart enough to do the line extensions. You can do it, but it's one way to increase the revenue stream. All right, I'm going to go to the next one. That was number seven or six. I'm not quite sure. That was six, you said, I think. That was six. Okay, seven. Yeah. Let the market tell you what it wants. Hmm. You guys, I, I really have to say this, and I think anybody that's in the innovation space will tell you the number one thing most of us miss, the, we don't know if an idea, if the market even wants it or even needs it. Right. And you can do all this work up front and realize, God, no one even cares about it. But if you can create and understand the market needs, test ideas. We talk about that at Invent Right, testing ideas very quickly, see if anybody wants it. But that's all about reading reviews, mm -hmm. looking at trends, seeing how where things are going, where the problems are, talking to people. That, that type of observation is what the pros do. That sounds different than <clears throat> doing what you like. Like this, I like this. I want this. That's not the same, is it? It's not the same at all, yeah. right? And I think most inventors do it that way, but the pros do not do it that way. Mm -hmm. They might go into a situation, and there was a TV show on this with IDEO, one of the top design firms on 60 Minutes. And what they do is that they go into a situation and they just do it as an you know, observation so that's all they do and this one particular situation they were looking at grocery uh carts and they wanted to say gee are those really efficient so without trying to invent anything they just wanted to watch people use them so a team of people went in there and they watched how people were using them mm -hmm. and they started realizing wow and they started asking people some questions and this and that and before they know it they said all right now let's invent for it Mm -hmm. Very different, very different structure. And I know most most inventors don't do that. And mm -hmm. I think that in order to get to that next level, you need to start looking at those type of things. So that's number seven, Andrew. What? Let's go ahead and get a question in. Okay, oh, boy, we got the fashion industry. We're gonna we're gonna beat all these poor inventors up with fashion related products. Selena says, <laughs> "I have idea for I have an idea for a sneaker. Where do I start?" Okay, so call uh, Nike. Call Nike. Yeah, it, it, he's being sarcastic. They're, they're not interested in licensing products. Um, again, we talked about earlier, Selena, I'm assuming you were here. Uh, fashion industry is brutal. Now, I believe we had a student that licensed a shoelace product. So if it's an accessory or it has functionality, but if you're saying, I have a whole new sneaker and your potential licensees are Nike and Adidas, you know, it's going to be next to impossible because their fashion industry companies now but if you have something that's functional like new okay. type of shoelaces or it you okay, could okay. license a new type of sneaker if it has functionality but the they're they're right. they're they're still pretty closed it, you, the, the sneaker that has a new innovation in my opinion there's a couple but this one always comes to mind because i think it's really brilliant is the sketchers how to how to put your foot into the shoe yeah, and, and I don't know exactly how they do it, but they just show people. You know, you, 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 you you're trying on. to put. Yeah, you're trying to put your. Yeah, but they're not slip-ons. But your foot just goes right into the shoe without you kind of bending down trying to put it on. Sure, that's probably some utility to that. Right. So it can be done, but but and and it, we don't say this about other industries, like almost none. But the fashion industry is just going to be tough. And if you know it's tough, and you know you need some sort of functionality or utility and you just know that ahead of time, you're gonna be better off. And you might say, I'm still gonna do it, Andrew. Great, at least you know what you're in for. And if you say, you know, 
I got five other ideas. I'll work on one of those. I didn't know that. At least you know now. So, well, Andrew, okay. I'm glad you said that because some people ask us, hey, at InventRight, do we evaluate ideas? Well, we really evaluate the marketplace. Yes. Right. We evaluate what the obstacles are going to be before you even start. Because we've been in this long enough. We know who's who. We know all the industries. We've seen ideas get licensed in just about every industry you could imagine. Mm -hmm. Doing it for 22 years, we've seen it all. So when someone says, hey, I've got this, I've got this new uh, apparel I want to license, we're like, okay, let's talk about what you're going to be up against. And maybe there's a way that we can do it. But without yeah. that type of guidance, you're really driving blind. But it's 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 not it's not when you're an event rights student, it's not your coach's opinion, and that's not Steven's opinion or my opinion. Right. It's our opinion based on facts, based on the marketplace. How is this innovation you have gonna fit in in the micro category of your invention, these other with similar products? And how do you need to tweak your marketing? Who are you gonna reach out to? So we do evaluate that, of course, but say good product, bad product, you know, you can't do that without the market facts. Um Let's see what we got here. Wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. This guy said, I first met Steven at IDO in Palo Alto a long time ago. Hey, oh, my Scott, God. Let's talk that. about that for a minute. You guys. <laughs> I remember let's that. Talk. I was there. All right. This Were is you, a, you can tell the funny story. Yeah, I remember. It was, okay. I remember. Do you want me to tell the story about no, they're no, like, no, what the me, hell are these guys me, doing here? Let me tell it story. because I haven't told okay. the story. I don't think I've, maybe I've told the story once or twice. It was fun. Uh, I was invited, first of all, to speak at Stanford's graduate um, engineering design uh, department. And because <clears throat> Stanford at the time realized that some of their students, <clears throat> graduate students, were not going into the innovation space. They were working for companies. And they, and they knew that this licensing model was a great idea for, for their students. So I came in, gave a great presentation, got to meet everybody. They were just wonderful. And I was really happy to be there. Great group. And then I was invited to speak at IDO, which is, you know, the, one of the top design firms in, in the country. Hell, maybe the world for all I know. And I was very proud. But they didn't realize what I was doing there. Because I was teaching their employees a way to leave their company, to leave the company. <laughs> okay. I was teaching them about product licensing and how you don't have to work for this company that you're working for right now. <laughs> okay. So, and they didn't really realize <clears throat> that's what I was teaching. Yeah. Right. And so I remember giving the lecture, having a good time, get to meet everybody. It was a wonderful facility. And after I was done, they politely got me out of there pretty quick. And they've never invited me back. Yeah, you know, because you, because uh, Stephen and I, we knew actually the the professor at Stanford was one of our students, and yes. and he he asked us to come speak, and then oh. somehow I don't know if it was Steen or somebody else that got us to speak at a yeah. break in the IDO um, offices, yeah. and I think some of the executives started coming, going. Like, I don't know who approved this guy. Like, why is he here? Like, he's trying to tell them they can invent and license stuff on their own. Like, and they're it like, was, okay, let's get, let's get him out of here. We it, want these people to be employees. Yeah. It was, it was so like, darn funny. And I'm going to have to mention one other, one other situation where they didn't realize who I was. <laughs> they didn't realize who they invited. I was at the USPTO. I love the USPTO. And they, they were having the big kickoff celebration of the Silicon Valley new office of the USPTO. So they said, hey, Steve, come on down, be the keynote speaker and bring some of your books. And I'm thinking, that's fantastic. I'll bring some of the books. So because I'm from San Jose, Los Gatos, I show up there, good crowd. I get up there, I give my presentation. And then I start giving away some of the books. Now, the book I brought was how to license, how to sell an idea with or without a patent. Now, I thought that was kind of funny. I also thought that the book was really about writing provisional patent applications, but the title was so enticing, they didn't say anything to me about it, Andrew, but I could tell they were a little irritated until years and years later. In fact, it was just last year, I was on a call with the USPTO and I had mentioned something about that meeting and the guy was there and he, <laughs> and he, looked, he said to me, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> he said it that way. 
Uh, anyway, but, thanks, Scott. So, uh, the, memory lane. Good. Going down memory lane. Thank you, so, Scott, for that. Um, David, David was a gentleman earlier that had an energy invention for a power plant. And so I just want to clarify, David. No, I do not think you're mentally ill. What, I, what I'm saying is, <laughs> <laughs> is literally... I'm not a, I'm not exaggerating guys like I thought, you, so I thought you said that too about I him. didn't say that <laughs> okay you're getting an inside look at what Steve and I have experienced over 23 years that most people never not get me. a look at not me no no Steven's not talking to these folks too <laughs> literally half of the people that have an energy invention that I talk to are are fairly off okay so David if you're an engineer or you're super smart uh, and you uh, he's got a he's got a working prototype Stephen, i believe oh, andrew i the, think that's so let classic. me finish my advice <laughs> okay <laughs> david my comment is some of the people you approach if i've had some very knowledgeable smart engineers i'm like that's freaking amazing i couldn't remotely do that but they make statements <laughs> that sound like they're crazy david that's what you have to avoid as an energy inventor you have to be avoid making fantastical statements and you have to state or, that you have a working or, prototype. Or people are going to perceive you like Andrew just did. Okay, yeah. So. Well, no, I didn't say I perceived him <laughs> like that. This is, I really do people a solid by giving them this advice. Oh, I Andrew, really do. Stephen's get far can too I, entertained by this. Can I tell this story forever that just happened? I think it's just classic. It's one of those classic examples of like. No, you I may did, not. I, I didn't like, say like, like you're gonna like you're gonna be okay if I say no. Really? <laughs> you're not even letting me talk. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me jump ahead, you guys. I think of number eight. Number eight, building a team. How many do you have, by the way? I think I have 54. I'm almost there. <laughs> okay. no, no, we number eight, eight minutes eight. left. Number, so number eight, building a team. <clears throat> now, I just want to let everybody know that I've always built teams. You know, Early on, I had a team with Russell Hicks that helped me do my drawings, the license ideas. And I have a team with Andrew Krause. And uh, I have a team with a lot of people. I like teams, right? And I tell everybody, when you join InventRight, this company is your team. It's not you alone anymore. And I like to tell everybody, I don't know of anybody that's been truly successful by themselves. You've had a lot of people holding you up. If you're reaching the top, trust me, there's a team behind you pushing you to the top. Mm. That's just facts, you guys. And, I, and if you don't have a team, if you're going this by yourself, you might want to think about, hey, maybe I need to build a team. So that is number eight. Yeah, right, it doesn't have to be us, but it, it needs to be somebody, yeah. you know. All right. Uh, uh, God, I'm okay. Such a good time. Well, this, he's not sharing I'm anything. It's such a good time. I think it's Friday. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mark said, I have a new revolutionary bolt that holds the toilet to the flange that holds the toilet to the floor. Where do I go with it? So, um, Mark, you've, you've got a new innovation in that area. There are companies that sell products in that area. Who do you license to? Companies that sell products in that area that have distribution in major retailers you want to be in. So if you went in and found a, a company in Lowe's, that sold something in that area, um, and they're in Lowe's, what do you know? They're selling a product, I know I'm being silly, in that area, and they're in freaking Lowe's. There's somebody, they're somebody worth, worth reaching out to. But people make their list of companies way too short. There's other places that people would buy those types of products other than Lowe's too. So it's not rocket science there, but yeah, a lot of people really struggle with that list of companies. Um, we're gonna be doing a promotion that includes an all access report list of companies in May, a little pre, but we'll be announcing that in May. So if you guys want to know about that, just let's, can we um, talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Okay. I have a project I'm working on and I'm reaching out to companies. <clears throat> in fact, we even teach classes at InventRight twice a month with Benjamin Harrison. He's our LinkedIn licensing expert and we're big believers at InventRight of leveraging LinkedIn to get to companies. It's the greatest tool on the planet, but you have to do it correctly, reaching out. But the point I'm saying is this, it's different with every company, it's different with every person, it's not easy to do. Although it sounds easy, in theory, it is easy. 
I'm here to tell you, I'm getting my butt kicked right now, Andrew. And I would love just a rejection. I'll take just a rejection. I'm not even getting anybody to, to look at it. I, I haven't found the right thing to say yet, so I'm playing with it. So I said to Andrew, look, this is not easy. I know how you're feeling if you're out there in the big fight of reaching companies. And I told Andrew, we need to do more to help people make those connections. And we do that. We have Bridging the Gap, where we bring on companies to invent right so our members can meet these companies and get get their hit list that's one way we help we help with the 3000 uh list of companies looking for ideas that invent right we help that way too but we're doing a deeper dive now i told andrew we got to go deeper and andrew created this program called all access where you give uh your category we look at it and we search not only for the companies, we search for their telephone numbers, their emails. We search for everything that you need to reach out to those people. And we give we give like the names of the people on LinkedIn and the link to their Andrew, profile. LinkedIn should always be the first. It's such place. an amazing yeah. uh, report because yeah. I realized the other day, without that, you're spending hours. You're literally spending hours and you're pulling your hair out if you don't have that type of report. You're going to hear us talk more about all access. I was telling Andrew, I would like to build a database, a new one. Not only the 3,000 companies looking for ideas. I want to go deeper. I want to build the biggest database of all the companies, all the categories in every different field. Everybody's contact information, their emails. I, I want their addresses. I want to know where they live. Now, that's probably too far. But what I'm saying is... <laughs> He's just... But what I'm saying is we have to make it easier. And that's what we're trying to do at Invent Right. Okay. All right. right, right. But we, we also really empower, guide, and mentor oh. our students to make their lists as well. We're always about empowerment, guys. Oh. You know, Scott. Scott's like, hey, I used to work at IDEO. Stephen, you are in trouble now. Oh, You're never going to get to you speak know, at IDEO see, again. I knew Scott I was a ringer when he privately emailed me telling me I was out of my mind. Right. And I love to get those emails. And, you know, sometimes I am, Scott. Sometimes I am a little out of my mind. And, and <laughs> but in, a, in a good way. In a good, in a way. good way. And so I, I emailed him back some articles I wrote and some things because what he thinks is happening. And I wanted to say, well, maybe, maybe yes. But let me show you a different perspective. And um, hopefully you got that, Scott. You didn't reply back to that email. All right. Because I know you're probably a little surprised at some of the information I gave you because he kind of believes in the patent system, which I do too. I do too. But I do believe it, it's, it can be broken at times. Okay, anyway, Andrew, I want to wrap this up real quick on my part of this, this meeting. Uh, on number nine, nine, but number nine, being part of the conversation. Find right. like-minded individuals like us, like you, like people here today. Find your group. Find your, do a meetup. Find your community. Find people that don't think you're crazy. Find people that support you, because I can tell you, if you're talking to it about your spouse or your friends or your family, they will go absolutely out of their mind. Find your community that supports you. All right. Let me yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're completely, totally normal here at InventRight. Yeah. But sometimes outside of InventRight, people are like, you're an inventor? You have ideas? Yeah. Like what? You know, some are very supportive and some are not. And if they're not, don't talk to them about it. If they're supportive, great. But don't drive them nuts. They don't want to hear about it every two minutes. Uh, right. We do, but they I'm don't. I'm almost done yeah. here, you guys. Be part oh, of the okay. community. I was gonna do the, well, let me, the let me, okay, go be, ahead. Be part oh, of the yeah. community. Go Join LinkedIn. Go to conferences. Go to trade shows. Be part of it. Have a voice. Have an opinion. Not like Scott's, though. Scott's a little irritating me. But everybody else, have your opinion. <laughs> have your opinion. And, and please be part of the conversation. It's very, very important. Keep learning. Keep current. Andrew, we had this this webinar with Courtney about AI, she kept us current. Yeah. Right? And the she kept me about current. It, I didn't know all that stuff. One thing about InventRight that you'll find no place else, because we see so many licensing deals in so many different industries, because we do a lot of volunteering, because we work with companies, we get to see what's current today. Not next week, not, not last week or a month, a year ago. If you're going to work with anybody, as a team, make sure they're in the fight and they're current. Stephen, Kevin, can can we publicly mention that 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 organization that starts with the word Smith? 
yet? Can we publicly say that yet or not yeah, yet? Do they yeah, need let me, yeah, we, yeah, let me mention this. We, there's a little organization called the Smithsonian. I, I, I don't know if you guys have heard of it before. <laughs> I think they have, yeah. Okay. Um, the Smithsonian has their own licensing department, but they use us for product licensing. Right. And they recognize we're very good at it. We know it. We, our coaching staff does it. We know the industry. So I guess what I'm saying is, even though you think you know all of this, this is such a specialized field that the, even the Smithsonian, which is big as they are with all those research scientists, they use us. Mm -hmm. Right. And they know because we're current. They know they know the techniques. They know we understand about NDAs and licensing agreements and companies and how to pitch and how to get people to say yes and that's why uh, they work with us. Okay, here we go. All right, so, giving back. Andrew. How many do you have? Do you really have 54? No, I'm almost done here. All giving right. Giving back. That's okay. Volunteer. And the reason why I'm saying that is that you learn a lot about yourself. You, you, you polish your skills when you're helping other people. Um, we just did uh, a volunteer at a high school where we did a 10-week course, and Ventwright did. Um, the teacher got teacher innovative teacher of the year at Time Magazine, and at InventRight we said, look, we're going to help the next generation STEM kids to learn about licensing. So we volunteered to help the next generation. So volunteer, you guys give back, and here's the last one here. Follow up, Andrew. You know I'm a, I'm really thinking about following up big time right now. If you don't yeah. follow up. On everything you're doing, things will not get done. It's proven. It is proven that most people do not follow up. Come on, Stephen. Just thinking about it isn't isn't that good enough? I just it run it over and over in my head. Follow no. up, follow up, follow up, okay. follow up. And there's a whole we should do a whole class just on how to follow up correctly. But it, there's there it is, Andrew. I'm done. Okay, that was good stuff, man. That was great. I love that we infused all that within answering questions. So there was one question here. Um, Amir had, do you have a private line where we can show or tell you our invention to get your opinion if it'll work or if it's a good idea? So this is all I ask. You can email me at Andrew and Eventwright, okay? Oh, my God. He said it. I'm, you guys. I, yeah, but, but please show me you did some research. Show me you did some research. Show me you, like, studied the other products in that space and show me a little bit of research and why you think it makes sense. Not just that it's a good idea, you know, and, and I, I can't tell you good idea or a bad idea because when we coach and mentor our students, we've got to study the marketplace for that category. So, but I can give you a knee jerk reaction. I do see some stuff. I'm like, what, you know, can you tell me why? And, it, but, but please don't, don't send me something where you haven't done any research and I can find it in 30 seconds. Do do a little bit of research. And Tell me why. We sign NDAs all the time too, you guys. So yeah, I'd yeah, be happy to. But okay. just do some research first, and I'll be happy to mm -hmm. take a look. Um, Stephen, you did an absolutely amazing job. All, everybody had these great questions. I feel like is really building a community here on LinkedIn with these with these live streams. Um, well, you, you know, guys, let me let me let me tell you where mm -hmm. that came from. That's the slide presentation that I just taught a class with. And so I, I pull these slides. You you cannot see them. No one else can see them. And I just I go tell. through the slides. Yeah, yeah you can yeah. tell. Because I'm actually on point. You know what I mean? I'm actually kind of like. <laughs> it's not just a. It's not just a, a one of your famous rants. This is actually you're like a more. <laughs> hey, you it. guys! Before we end, I want to say one thing. Look for our promotion at Inventrite for May. May is National Inventors Month. It's a big celebration. We want to give back to the inventing community. We have a special program that you're you're going to be shocked at what we're going to do to help you become successful. So please check it out and you'll see it on our website. You'll see it, we'll be making some posts on LinkedIn because it's a big time for all of us to share creativity with the world. And we want to be part of your journey. We want to help you and you'll see that in a couple of days. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Take care and keep inventing. Catch you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>